Hey guys, so um, I'm here with Ming Lai, Mark Pinto, and myself, Emerson Diaz. First, we're going to do some introductions. Ming, if you could go ahead and just give us uh, some of your background, how you got into working with veterans, and also for those who did not yet see the film, just a quick synopsis of what it's about, um, what you hope for the viewers to get out of it, and what, yeah, what they should take away. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Ming Lei, the director of Visions of Warriors. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for hosting us, uh, uh, moderating this discussion, Jemerson, uh, as well as uh, Juliana Robbins over at Calif California Center for the Book, uh, Lena Claw over at uh, San Jose State University, Rosemary Van Lair, Deborah Eistrecker over at the San Jose Public Library at the beautiful uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Library. Uh, a lot of people came together in order to create this uh, program for us, and so uh, we're deeply honored to be able to be here. Um, back in 2013, I learned about uh, Susan Quaglietti. Uh, she's a veteran nurse. She'd been working in the field for 25 years. Um, before becoming a nurse, she wanted to become uh, an artist, and then uh, uh, later on, she decided to become a nurse, eventually became a nurse practitioner. She combined her love of art and her practice, nursing practice and ultimately came up with the Veteran Photo Recovery Project, uh, which uses uh, fluting moral injury, PTSD, uh, military sexual trauma, and other, military, uh, other mental illnesses. Very nice. Um, and I th that's a wonderful question. Uh, I think ultimately the film is about hope. It's about offering hope to veterans and their families, uh, supporting mental health care workers and other caregivers, pe people who support veterans. Uh, I want people to walk away with a feeling of hope that there is alternative types of therapy that can help treat mental illness, uh, that can help supplement uh, traditional therapy. Very nice, thank you. Uh, Mark, if you uh, can you give us a little bit about your background, uh, include your military background, and of course, uh, what brings you here with us today. Yeah, hi. I'd like to echo, first of all, what Ming said about uh, all, you know, offering my um, gratitude to everyone who brought all this together. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, we met last time, Ming, and uh, uh, I am a uh, former retired Marine, Marine Corps officer. I was a helicopter pilot, uh, 1982 to 2002. Um, Gulf War veteran, non-combatant in theater, uh, but a non-combatant in the war. Um, after retiring from the Marine Corps, I became a Buddhist priest. I did this for nine years. And then when I left the priesthood, I went to San Jose State University uh, and enrolled in the uh, photography MFA program and ended up with my um, MFA in photography from San Jose State. And in that time, when I was at San Jose State, I was being seen at the Menlo Park VA for uh, depression, uh, PTSD. They don't have a diagnosis, or they did not at the time, I don't know now, at the VA for moral injury, but I'm sure uh, that what my symptoms were were more accurately uh, falling in line with moral injury. Mm -hmm. And then it was through the Menlo Park VA where I was introduced to the photo recovery project. I met um, my therapist advised me to meet Jeff Stadler. Jeff Stadler is an art therapist. He's in the movie as well. Uh, and then through them, uh, I was able to meet uh, Susan Quaglietti and got in on the ground floor kind of as a peer mentor in the uh, program since I was already studying photography. Uh, and I found it to be a, an, an amazing experience and then eventually called in to work on the film, uh, to be in the film, to be interviewed and be part of the film. And I was honored to be part of it. It was, it was a great project. Very awesome. Um, I'll just give a little bit of background on myself. My name is Jemerson Diaz. Um, I joined the Marine Corps when I was 18, from 2004 to 2007. I had one tour in Iraq, in the western part of Iraq, Arupa. I was a light armored vehicle crewman. I was just a driver. Um, and I'm diagnosed with PTSD along with um, bipolar type 1. I've gone through PTSD therapy with uh, the VA and, and um, what brings me here is because of the treatment and along with 
Um, just being really active in school, I was able to get my bachelor's degree. I worked with Dr. Elena Claw as a Vet Connect peer leader, did things like that. It, it helped me to, um, to get engaged more with the world again, and I was able to become a teaching associate for San Jose State. So, um, yeah, that's, it's just really nice that people come together and show that there is hope for those who have gone through such a pretty tough time that a lot of, I would say, the majority of people will look at most veterans and they would think, oh, nothing's wrong with them, but deep-rooted inside are things. So I'm glad that we're able to have a discussion today to really open up about this. Okay, so the first question is regarding moral injury. I know that you mentioned that a little bit, um, Mark, and if you could go um, if you could go deeper into that, what is moral injury? How is that different from post-traumatic stress disorder? And then also if you could, if, if you'll all talk a, a little bit about MST, military sexual trauma. Sure, uh, thank you. I was um, introduced to the concept of moral injury by doing research on art while I was getting my master's in photography. I was doing some artwork related to veterans reintegration issues and especially veteran suicide. And in my research of veteran suicide, I came across a paper that was written uh, about moral injury. And that uh, paper, as I was reading it, I was looking at the symptoms and, and I recognized them as what I was going through. And I immediately uh, definitely connected to that. And I also felt that I had been mis misdiagnosed uh, with PTSD. And I think some of the symptoms are the same. So to answer the question, what is moral in injury? Um, moral injury, moral injury uh, is something when a person witnesses or participates in or knows of something that is just just violently against you know your moral roots so you, you're raised a certain way obviously killing is something we shouldn't do as people and things like that so and when you go through a trauma where you're forced to participate or even if you as a team member I think there's a full spectrum but if you uh, participate in any way and then you have to after that is over you have to come to terms with it and that's where the moral injury comes in how your ability to connect with, uh, to reconcile, I should say, what you've seen or what you've participated in. Uh, uh, especially as a member of the military, although it's certainly, I think the doctor is making decisions today on who lives and who can't live in the, moral, in the uh, COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic. Uh, those people have to also live with a moral, you know, it's a moral crisis that they have to resolve. And so there's going to be a lot of it. There's more talk of it, I'm sure. And I'm, I've been kind of crusading to have the VA recognize it um, because it's tr treated differently than PTSD. PTSD, which is hypervigilance, it resides in the lipid system. It's a different fight or flight syndrome. It's a totally different thing than moral injury, which is more of a cognitive, you know, learning how to deal with uh, those things that you participated in. Right. Ming, um, in regards to moral injury, um, what have you noticed out there working with other vets? Did you notice a theme of uh, moral injury, people feeling uh, really bad about the decisions that they've made in regards to, uh, and how that might be different from PTSD? And I know that you've uh, worked with a lot of vets that um, had MST, military sexual trauma. Can you just discuss about those three main topics? Uh, my first introduction to the Veteran Photo Recovery Project, you know, was at the VA of Menlo Park where it's based. Uh, they have a welcome center there that's uh, absolutely beautiful on the very front of the campus. And, um, you know, I was expecting to see uh, an entire team of grizzled veterans from the Iraq War, but uh, it wasn't like that. Uh, when I walked into the room, there's an entire woman, uh, entire room filled, filled with women who were suffering from military sexual trauma. Mm. And so then, uh, you know, I was wondering, I didn't really know that much about it, but as I started working on the project, I began to learn more about military sexual trauma. Uh, it has very similar uh, symptoms to PTSD, but it's so prevalent in the military that they gave it, gave it its own classification. Mm -hmm. So that was my introduction uh, in working on the project longer. I was introduced to Mark where I learned more about moral injury and um, 
it was deeply affecting to learn about uh, what he was going through, moral ambiguity when you're trying to, you know, engage in war or, you know, engage in a conflict that, that could play heavily. Yeah. Um, I know um, whenever I think about moral injury, um, I, the first instance that I had was, of course, boot camp, Marine Corps boot camp. And you're taught to, uh, well, you're in a way forced to do whatever you're told and it doesn't matter what it is. Um, and so when Mark, when I feel um, that in a way, at least the Marines, they want, they train us so that we could be like machines. Like you just get the job done. They press a button and you do it. That's just how it is. We don't care how you feel. We don't care what you think about. We don't care what your beliefs are. Um, and in a way, of course, I mean, that has a dramatic effect on the human, on the human being. And I know that it's, it's a drastic process. Um, once a person's out of the military and they're trying to get back into learning about who they are and so on and so forth. Um, and having to live with the decisions that they made, even if uh, they were uh, like minor things. Um, okay, so let's get to um, some of the main issues that a lot of veterans um, are dealing with. And let's talk about suicide along with um, unhealthy coping methods that many veterans are dealing with. So if Mark, if you could, Talk a little bit about that, a little bit of your story of any unhealthy things that you've um, engaged with in the past. Sure. Um, I think the common, when you talk about un unhealthy coping mechanisms, would be anything to kind of numb, you know, the sensations. And that's true not only in PTSD, but in moral injury as well. I mean, again, they're often treated similarly by the, uh, uh, by the community, but, uh, but Instead of, uh, I know in PTSD, oftentimes they will try to mask those symptoms and just try to cover them. Uh, and for moral injury, I don't think that's healthy. So uh, even some of the coping mechanisms that are provided by the VA may not be healthy coping mechanisms for, uh, for moral injury because you need to be cognitive, you need to be alert, you need to be able to work through these things. Um, so the unhealthy, the common ones are alcohol in my and uh, drugs. But another one in my case was I stayed busy. I kind of uh, tried to just not cope with it by putting it in the back and just being so busy. And I did that both as a Marine and then as a priest. Uh, I didn't really have time to deal with the moral uh, turpitude that I, uh, you know, that I had gone through. I didn't, um, I hadn't uh, worked through it at all. And in fact, when I went back to school, it was the first time I had a hole in my schedule and I started to do artwork about veteran suicide and uh, veteran reintegration issues that all of a sudden I had to confront the war that I had participated in for the first time. And that's when I uh, became very depressed. Unhealthy mechanism, isolation is another one, uh, an unhealthy coping mechanism. And it's exactly the opposite of what I needed to do, but I couldn't deal with people. And so, yeah, that's one of them. And then the, uh, the Veterans Photo Recovery Project, in addition to therapy, were two ways that, of uh, many ways that I, um, tools that I use to get out of it, to get out of the depression. Mm. Ming, um, what did you notice working with all the vets, um, unhealthy um, coping mechanisms that you've noticed out there? A lot of the veterans uh, were involved in uh, substance abuse, uh, from alcohol to, to drugs. And so um, it just seems like uh, those things go hand in hand, unfortunately. Um, clinical psychologist Kristen McDonald was saying, you know, we, there's a section in our film about um, uh, the suicide uh, rate that's happening. Uh, depending on whatever study you look at, you know, it's roughly 22 veterans are committing suicide a day, which is, a, you know, a shocking number. Uh, many of the suicides, um, uh, there's, uh, you know, drugs or alcohol involved, which, you know, compounds uh, the problems of uh, mental illness. And so, uh, um, you know, the veterans in our film had talked about, uh, you know, and it all 
you know, obviously it changes your mood and, and you know, uh, uh, affects uh, your mental illness. I would, jump, I would jump around from different relationships. I would um, not be faithful in the relationships that I was in. I would isolate, avoid people, avoid crowds, avoid going to shopping malls, especially. Um, I didn't like people walking behind my back. I would always... If I was going to sit down at a restaurant, I had to have my back to a wall of some sort. I'd want to know where the exits are. I need to know where everyone's at. Um, and I was always on the edge. It felt like I, was, I, was, I almost wanted to get in a fight. You're, you're looking for something um, to, to trigger you almost, almost like a switch. and. Uh, I know for me it was getting really really bad because uh, one time I almost got in a fight with the father of one of my exes and it, to the point where I, I didn't mind if if I was going to get killed or if if I was going to kill someone it got to the point where I know that I needed to get help um, th I know this is a pretty vulnerable topic to talk about but when it comes to suicide uh, Mark have you ever had any thoughts of suicide or friends that thought about it or anything like that i've lost i've definitely lost friends to suicide and i, I myself have been my darkest darkest hour i been i didn't have the ideations but um i didn't I, at the same time i didn't see a purpose in life i didn't see a purpose mm -hmm. to continue yeah so that's the darkest point i got to i was not I don't know if that's considered suicidal or not, but I didn't have ideations. I just couldn't uh, see a reason to go on. Thank you for sharing that, because you're not alone for sure. I've, I've thought about not necessarily going all the way through with it, but to that dark point where you know that if I take a few more steps down this road, it's mm -hmm. that's it. Um, I, I feel that a lot of veterans go through that process and they, we just don't talk about it. And it's, uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, something that I like to talk about is healthy coping things. Let's talk about some light uh, hope, you know, light at the end of the tunnel kind of stuff. So um, what are some healthy coping skills that you've got into, Mark? And I, I'd like to hear your story on uh, how you help sh turn things around. I think, uh, especially for moral injury, uh, it's almost like you need to balance the moral checkbook in a way. I mean, you've, if you, you oh, yeah. feel that you've done something really horrible or you participated in a war that was unjust as an example, and you're having trouble reconciling that, at least you can put something back either helping. In my case, I became a veteran's advocate through my artwork. Um, and also, uh, I also was a member of a, uh, a group called the Coming Home Project. I was on the board of directors for that. And so we would go on retreats with veterans who were coming back from war and they were deeply affected. Um, being on that, uh, that uh, board and going to these retreats with veterans, when you're, you know, no matter how bad things are internally in your own way, when you're helping others, it, it kind of sets your misery, maybe some self-esteem uh, through mm -hmm. that effort that might help. Yeah. Um, and, and then that, that's one. And then the other one would be, uh, for me healthy coping mechanisms what i learned in buddhism about meditation and then applying that through my photography because it's like when i have my camera up i'm really just looking for beauty and that's really a when you're in a dark dark place and you're looking at using my camera uh, to connect to beauty and just try to stay grounded that way i'd like to know a little bit about your spiritual path how did you you say that you became a buddhist priest at a time right can you can you tell us a little bit about that background story? Because that's not a lot of people become a Buddhist priest. Um, I'd like to know, like, what, what actually Well, I was that? stationed in Japan for many years. And what I know um, I became interested in Buddhism very early in my Marine Corps career, uh, probably about 28 years old, 29 years old. Uh, and I, I began to practice and study. I, w I used to go to Tokyo frequently for training. Uh, and I ended up... Um, kind of wanting to be a member of the priesthood early on, uh, but I, I did stick it out, finish my career, 
And then literally the next day, the day after I retired, I joined the priesthood. Um, but it, it's after I'd already been practicing for 15 years, uh, pretty serious, very seriously. Um, yeah, I was just intrigued by the, uh, the, the different way of looking at the world, the Buddhist way of looking at the world than the Western way that I had been raised. It was a stark contrast to what, the way I had been raised. And you still practice the, the Buddhism culture and everything? Um, and well, so there's a, there's a dogmatic approach to any religion, and then there's the personal approach. And I, I'm currently not uh, attending at a, at a temple, any trainings that way. I do um, continue to use the same exact meditative okay. tools that I was taught in, uh, in my daily life uh, through, through photography and otherwise. Right. I try to be more aware. Did you go through the PTSD treatment with the VA at all? Um, and no. if so, I, oh, you didn't? Okay. No, I, I, my PTSD was from a helicopter crash. It was a one-time incident. And um, I, don't, I, I didn't actually think I needed it. And I wasn't advised that I needed to go through that. My was more related to uh, the moral injury and, and depression, gotcha. from my, most of my treatment. Gotcha. Ming, um, could you talk about some of the healthy coping skills that you've noticed um, veterans either develop or what did they turn to and um, what hope that that you've noticed out there? Um, the Veteran Photo Recovery Project um, uses photography therapy. So photography therapy is actually a subset of art therapy, which yeah. falls underneath the umbrella of alternative therapy. And so uh, what I learned in the film was that, you know, not uh, with traditional therapy, uh, whether it's uh, individual counseling or group counseling or medication, it doesn't always work. They say that 50% of the time it doesn't work. And so then uh, what are veterans left with if that does not work? Uh, and so uh, there's been the rise of alternative therapy, you know, a whole range of things. Uh, you know, in our film, we cover uh, photography therapy, but we also cover a lot of art therapy. We think that's invaluable in being able to uh, uh, use it as a healthy uh, practice to try to treat your uh, mental illness. But uh, a lot of the veterans in the film, they have uh, little dogs that they're, they're holding, and it's, we don't really talk a lot about that, but uh, pet therapy, oh, yeah. canine therapy, um, is a very useful thing in trying to reconnect with another living being. Uh, you see people engaged with their pets. You see how loving that they can be, that they can actually ha have deep, meaningful relationships. And that shows, you know, it gives you a sense of hope. But right. at the same time, too, you know, there's recreation therapy, uh, doing sports and recreation. There's uh, equine therapy, you know, uh, riding horses. And so veterans have been involved in all different types of uh, alternative therapy uh, I in my own personal opinion a veteran hmm. there's something I do want to show really quick I know that you're talking about um, art therapy and this is something that we made um, in art therapy because I, I went through the PTSD um, treatment over in um, San Jose VA clinic and it's split into three things one is um, exposure therapy another one is cognitive processing therapy and then third is art therapy. And one of the things asked, um, they said to draw or color, do whatever you want, but express how you feel other people see you on the outside and then draw yourself on the inside. And um, so at the time, I think this was probably around 2013, um, it was just this this face of gloom and um, hatred or or whatever it may feel. I know that that's that's the feeling I had inside that how other people saw me um, when I would just be triggered all the time, but I I just didn't have any control um, expressing myself in that in that manner. So it really did help. It's interesting how art therapy. Um, in, in the different forms that it has in photography and in and, and so many ways that there is so much deeper than just that surface um, look in, of the colors. There, there's a whole array of emotions, thoughts, beliefs, values, all hidden in as gems within in those things. Mark, would you like to talk a little bit about 
your experience with art. I know you have a dog, right? And then, I do. and what, yes, and, and your, <laughs> your experience with all that. Yeah, um, my dog has been a great part. Uh, I, I lost a pug a couple of years ago, but I have a beautiful uh, rescue dog out, out back right now, and, and she's enjoying the rainy day out there. Um, but she's, yeah, we're connected, and uh, dogs are amazing. There's, uh, Ming mentioned it, but, and there's actually, uh, I work with a lot of veterans who uh, volunteer to help uh, train those dogs up to be companion or working service dogs. Uh, service dogs that are trained in PTSD, they can recognize the hormonal difference by smell. I mean, what's going on in your body, adrenaline, things. Uh, and then they'll alert and they'll divert your attention and get in your lap and things like that. They're amazing. It's amazing to watch and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, as far as artwork goes for me, I mean, there was there's basically two things that I learned from my art about um, therapy in, in terms of therapy. One of them was getting my story out. I mean, it was a way of getting my story. My initial artwork was very much uh, social, social justice, uh, veterans reintegration issues, but through that, my own story came out. And my own, um, uh, I guess I started to work through the war that way. And it was something I had to do. And I think that was a big part. The other part of the, the therapy was, like I said, the physical connection with the camera. And then the intent to go out and take pictures of beauty. Uh, as opposed to, sometimes I was doing the social work where I was working with veterans reintegration issues. But sometimes I just had to go away and take pictures of birds or take pictures of flowers. And when I did that, there was an intent to connect with something beautiful. And when I was connecting with something beautiful, everything else was gone. I didn't have to think about the United States or the wars or, you know, or veteran suicide even. I just wanted to let go of that. I had to get away from it. So it was my way of reconnecting to something good and beautiful. And I still continue that practice today. Yeah, it sounds like when you focus on the beauty and the good that still exists, it, it, it creates more hope that, yes, um, there is ugly and there's horror out there and it's nasty. Um, that exists and that's, it's a horrible thing. And at the same time, there are still beautiful things. There is still hope. There is still love. And it doesn't take anything away. That The ugliness exists. It's like the darkness exists and the light exists. It's important to recognize the darkness, but to also recognize the light. And if you're going to live, then walk in the way that makes you, that works well for you. And yeah, I mean, that's, it sounds like that's a little bit of what I'm getting. And that's kind of the hope from what we're all looking to get in, in a sense. Um, can, can I add, that's very well, oh yeah, for sure. that's very well said. And, and when my, in my darkest moments, I left all that behind. I would camera side, not going outside and just uh, isolate myself. And that that's, you know, without being able to step out and having the awareness that I needed to step back from it. And the VA uh, therapy helped me with that. And then the camera helped yeah. me with that. And my training as a Buddhist helped me. Yeah, it really does. Um, it, it does a lot to think about, about that. Through the treatment, it helped me it helped me realize that I could stay in between the rocks and the waves and I could get hit all day and all night. But if you get that bird's eye view, you'll realize that there is a limit to that, the, those rocks. And if you keep on moving, you could get on the beach and then move towards the hills. And those, that place exists too. Mm -hmm. But if I choose to keep going in between the, the rocks and the waves, I'm just going to keep on getting hit. And then eventually I'll just give up. Um, and I know what, what helped out a lot is something similar to this, just you and me as veterans talking and, and knowing that, you know, there's other people suffering out there. It, it may, to some people, it may seem like, oh, that's horrible. There's more suffering. It's, it's actually a big connection saying, oh man, I, I, I'm so happy that someone else is, is still out there, still fighting hard. Um, and, um, and, and we, we still exist. And it's like that recognition that someone else gets what I'm going through. So it, that's actually a very powerful thing, I think. Um, Ming, um, have you noticed that out there working with the veterans that regardless of the fact that they're going through a hard time, it's through the support of other veterans that help them um, keep on going? I, I know that you worked with a lot of veterans in, in that regard. But. 
Absolutely. I, I think the communal aspect of the veteran photo recovery project was very important. Uh, when I walked to, when I entered that room filled with uh, women that were suffering from uh, military sexual trauma, a lot of them are great friends. And so, you know, over the course of the therapy, they were able to learn about a lot about uh, each other, but by doing so, they learned a lot about themselves. And so it's being able to share that was, uh, that created that connection. Um, the Veteran Photo Recovery Project, one of the uh, projects, if you will, at the very end of uh, that program was uh, uh, creating a portfolio to share uh, your, photo, your photography, your photos uh, with others. And so, you know, veterans typically, they don't necessarily want to talk about their experience. They don't want to get up in front of a room, uh, uh, you know, but in this particular project, uh, Susan Quaglietti and her team um, had them get up and talk in front of an audience to share their work. So as uh, Ryan Gardner uh, and also uh, Jeff Stadler had said, uh, there's kind of two schools to talk, uh, two schools of thought regarding this. One is you can create the artwork and that's therapeutic in itself, or you can create it and sharing it. And I think by sharing it, you actually create a deep connection because you're sharing something personal of yourself uh, with someone else and that creates a bond. And so I think that helps reconnect you with, uh, with uh, society, with humanity. And so I think that's a very, very valuable. Mm. And that's something I'd like to talk about, um, vulnerability. I know a lot of veterans don't like talking about that, but it's, um, it's something that we got to face in, in the long run. Mark, if you could talk a little bit about vulnerability, what that means to you, and um, how do you engage with it? Does it make any difference, or um, your, your thoughts on that? Sure. I think the, the machismo culture of the military <laughs> the training uh, is – you know strength it's always about strength and and oh, yeah. and you're taught i guess maybe i don't even know if we're explicitly taught but that just the the idea of being vulnerable well strategically in military that would not be a good thing of course and then personally as a human you would think well that's a weakness but vulnerability uh also can be seen as a strength obviously if right. you can uh understand when you are at your limit or hopefully before you get to your limit you can understand, hey, if I, I need some help, you know, I, and it's okay to uh, need help. Uh, everybody needs help. Like when you're, it's interesting, we could be marching side by side on a forest march and the guy next to me, the Marine next to me is struggling. I'll pick up his pack or I'll carry something for him. So he's showing a vulnerability and it, nobody cares about that. That's okay. Mm. But when you start talking about psychological issues, oh my God, you, know, you don't want to be vulnerable in that way. Um, that's, mm. and that's unfortunate because it, I think almost every vet that I know that has, has struggled with PTSD, with moral injury, has talked about suicide um, or even attempted. Uh, they, they talk about how they didn't want to admit that they were weak and they, they couldn't admit to themselves that they were weak. And once they do, that's when the healing begins, actually. That oh, yeah. opens the door for healing. Oh, yeah. It's unfortunate so many times that it gets to the point of suicide or an attempt on suicide and especially with men um suicide even the attempt is much more violent than uh than others so it might and by the time they attempt suicide either by hanging or if it's you know um gun violence or whatever it may be it's so much damage is already done um so when it comes to i, I liked what you said earlier when uh, you're talking about if, if a marine is vulnerable and like say they're they're almost dying on a on a pack march or or something like that on a rock march i'm sorry um and another marine helps them that's seen as teamwork and strength and um that's what we're trying to do we're working as a unit however when it comes to other scenarios it's weak to be like this it's weak to be like that um i think when when it comes to, if, if you want to reclaim your humanness and the, the, the person inside in that identity, and I know that in the Marines and in, in other branches, they say, we don't want individuals, we can't have it. But once you're gone from the, from the military, you are an individual, you're, you're a human being, you're different from other people. Um, 
you don't have to live life by the numbers and everything like that. You, you have, you have to discover who you are and that literally takes a vulnerability. Um, and I think of, you know, if, if you think about a seed that needs to germinate, it, it's very vulnerable at that time in order for it to grow strong, but the vulnerability has to be addressed um, at some point. It has to recognize who it is. And, and the only way to do that is to, is to open up. Um, otherwise, that importance that is in every individual, it stays shut down. And if it's not recognized, it's not nurtured, if no one cares about it, especially if that person doesn't care about himself, then um, why live, you know? And then that's where suicide comes in and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, if you could talk a little bit about uh, vulnerability, have, what have you noticed veterans um, do in order to engage in vulnerability? Uh, as, far, as part of this program with the California Center for the Book, this uh, Community Conversations with Veterans, uh, this is happening through the California libraries. And so we've had the good fortune to be able to share our film with a lot of libraries throughout California. In visiting mm. these libraries, you learn about their veteran services as well as their veterans resource centers. And so these are beautiful libraries that we're, uh, you know, going to to screen our films and uh, these uh, amazing um, veterans resource centers that are staffed by very caring volunteers. At the same time, um, not a lot of veterans go to access these services. I think it might be due in part to, you know, if you're trained to be strong and not to be vulnerable, then to admit that you're, you know, you have issues or admit that you have a mental illness or you, or you need help, that's very difficult to do. And so the access is right there, but they're still not willing to, to go and receive it. And so uh, I applaud the, the libraries for being able to open up their arms to, uh, to veterans by offering these, all these ranges of services. But um, they've have to, uh, they've been out, uh, actively outreaching towards the community to try to get the veterans in there. Um, I think this is uh, one of their efforts, the, these screenings and this particular Q&A uh, is an effort to reach out to veterans. Yeah. Uh, and when you are uh, vulnerable, you need a safe space uh, in order to be able to admit your vulnerability that you are suffering. And so uh, libraries, veterans resource centers, uh, the VA's uh, you know, services for mental health, all these organizations that we uh, have been uh, community partners with our screenings, uh, they offer these safe spaces for veterans to be able to, you know, talk about their problems and get treatment. Um, I liked how you were talking about those who are already um, reaching out to help veterans. And that's what I'd like to get to right now. Um, I hope by the end of the viewing of the film, and thank you so much, Ming, for putting that film together, um, that the viewers will recognize that a lot of veterans are, are suffering seemingly invisibly um, through military sexual trauma, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and moral injury. So um, the, the main question here now is what could we do to help? And when I say that, I mean, what could veterans do to help? What could those who support veterans do to help? And also what could the general public do to help this, um, this, this major issue? Um, I guess if I can take the lead and I'll hand it off to, sure, yeah. to Mark. Um, you know, our film is just one film, and, but there's many, many films out there, some fantastic films, uh, artists that are creating works to raise awareness about veterans' issues. I think that, that can help. Uh, but, but the irony is, is that a veteran is not inclined to see our film. Uh, you know, if you're suffering from mental illness, you're isolating yourself from others, you're not going to go to a theater, you're not going to go to a special screening, uh, you're not going to, you know, look at this on, online because it's just painful. But uh, we are trying to reach out to the people who love and care for our veterans, you know, the families, their caregivers, uh, healthcare professionals, the, the concentric circles that surround a veteran, those are the people we are trying to reach in order to ultimately reach the veteran. And yeah. so then 
by supporting by supporting our libraries, by supporting our community, by supporting healthcare organizations, uh, veterans organizations, we can ultimately reach that veteran that's inside that you know the innermost concentric circle. So I think uh, it really takes uh, an entire village to be able to not only raise a child but in turn you know assist a, a veteran uh, taking care of their mental illness and helping them to reintegrate into society. Very nice. And the way that I'm picturing that is almost like the layers of an onion. So it sounds like you want to get to the very core and the one, and you're not directly going to the core. What you're doing is you're going through those rings and in order to eventually help the, the core eventually. It sounds like that's what you're, you're working on. Like, I know that the core is not going to budge, but we could work with the rings. And that's, that's the idea. Is, is, and that sounds like a wonderful idea. Um, Mark, if you could please um, uh, talk about like how could we help vets, those who support vets, and the general public, in regards to what we're all going through here. I think when I first got to San Jose State University, and I did a similar uh, path to you did, uh, Jemerson, when uh, with your Vet Connect and peer mentorship through Dr. Elena Claus program, uh, going to that the first the first veterans class and watching these veterans come back literally a couple of weeks sometimes or a couple months from the battlefield and they're at school they're at a university and they're struggling i mean it's crazy and so in our veteran service or veteran student organization as well as a veteran i participated in that and we tried to reach out to the veterans we had different ways to try to reach out to veterans it's usually most effective face-to-face, one-to-one. I mean, uh, you could go on social media and we tried all different means, but the most effective way seemed to be one-to-one. Veterans uh, recognizing that there was some compelling reason to join an organization, whether it was scholarships, uh, having your resume created Uh for you at at the the university, Um, uh, some kind of therapy, uh, some kind of program where the veterans could work together in a safe place. Ming brings up that safe place. That's amazing. The vet. Now there's a beautiful one. That's a safe place where people can come in and they can uh, they can blow off steam. You just get out of a classroom where you're frustrated, and you you know you're still dealing with severe PTSD, and then you can go into this place and decompress with uh, other vets who've been there and they've already been through this before. Uh, as far as communities reaching out, there's there's they do reach out. They they are making. I think we're at a record time. When the Vietnam era came back, they didn't have the support that we have now. There's a lot of things that are out there, but it really comes down to one-to-one. Somebody has to take that better and recognize yeah. that they may be struggling. Um, and he, somebody asked me, what, what, what do you say to a veteran like that? He just got back from war. I don't know how to talk to a veteran. Say, how are you? Good morning. Yeah. You yeah. know, just talk to them and connect. And then through that process, you develop some kind of trust I'm talking to the non-veteran community now that's looking to help and they don't know how. Just try to find a way to connect to them and say, I understand, I get, I, well, no, I'm sorry, that's a problem sometimes, say, I understand. I understand that you need some help or you're looking for some help and maybe we can help. And then steer them to resources. So the non-veteran who wants to help should be aware of resources uh, that can help veterans, uh, especially family members, um, clergy, uh, any members of the community, the library, it's, they, they're doing amazing work. They're trying to reach out, but you have to grab the Marine or the, the veteran and bring them to the service and make sure they understand, give them a compelling reason to go. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think um, that, that direct connection, I think, um, especially when it comes to Marines, it's it's very familiar, like in the barracks, if somebody knocks on the door, or like bust in and, and it's, and the party starts right there like we we just start hanging out we just start hanging out with each other and that that recognition of hey you're my friend you're my buddy let's go let's go do something let's go over to let's go bowling or something and it's knowing that someone else still cares about you it is such a big deal um if people were to just do something similar like that i think that would at least get the wheels going so eventually the the veteran would get up and just get active again start moving because it's i know it it really sucks for for veterans to just sit down isolate start drinking and things just go downhill from that and that's and it's so easy to do that we have access to um 
we have so much access to do stupid things, um, especially when no one's telling us what to do anymore. I mean, once we're used to that for years and then, uh, then that's taken away, then we end up just um, a lot of the time just sitting around doing nothing and nothing really good comes from that. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, we, I, I think what we need is just we need some leaders out there who who be willing to go out, put in the time, and start um, getting the guys together again. Then I think that really helps out a lot. Uh, if we could do um, some closing remarks, I just want to say thank you, Ming. Thank you, Mark, for coming here together. Everybody who put this all together, um, Mark, if you like to give some closing words for your, uh, your experience and yourself. Well, yeah, I think. Uh, again, thanks to Ming for the film, and I know it was, uh, that's a tough project. I mean, I don't even think you knew what you were getting into when you got in there, but uh, it was a tough project. It was um, a tough time in, in my life. It was uh, like really at a tough time, and uh, this film uh, gives me hope that uh, it's going to reach the, the people that need to see uh, about the veteran community and the struggles that they go through, especially the, you know, my big thing, I keep beating the drum on moral injury, trying to give people uh, raise awareness on moral injury. Uh, so thank you for the film. I think it does a wonderful job of that. I think, um, and also thanks to uh, Dr. Claw and, and the people at the library, San, uh, the MLK library, the San Jose State University, all the people that have supported the uh, veterans cause going forward. Um, I've seen so much change in the just since I started school there. I've moved up to Oregon now, but I keep in touch and I'm watching all these wonderful changes occur at the university. So keep up the good work there. Jemerson, appreciate that and everybody else who's helping with that team. Thank you. Awesome. Ming, if you could like, uh, if you give a few closing words, however you want to go. I'd like to thank all the veterans in the film. Uh, if, you know, we, if they're, if it wasn't for their participation, their willingness to share and help others, um, I think it's really difficult for uh, a veteran or actually just uh, any person in general to get in front of the camera and you know share your life story, especially the the deepest, uh, most meaningful parts of your life. Um, but all the veterans uh, participated in this project. They got in front of the camera. They they shared their story because they wanted to help others. And so I, it, it really warms my heart to be able to know that they did that is just so that they can help someone else. Um, so thank you to all the veterans. Thank you to Susan Quagliati for creating the program. Uh, she actually worked with an entire team. Uh, it, was, it was really great, an interdisciplinary team, I think, because of the dynamics of that team, the synergy between them, their friendship, uh, that the program was successful. There was an uh, art therapist, uh, Jeff Stadler, the clinical psychologist, Ryan Gardner, and, uh, uh, no, sorry, sorry uh, clinical social worker, Ryan Gardner, and clinical psychologist, uh, Kristen McDonald, as well as the support of the VA. Uh, all of them worked together in order to be able to create this program. Uh, I think it's important not to only have a program like this, but to try to, you know, extend this uh, alternative therapy, art therapy, cross um, uh, therapy programs across the country so that veterans have access to this uh, type of care when traditional therapy doesn't work. And so uh, I thank them for doing that. And I think um, we've been, I've been working on this project since 2013. So uh, speaking to what Mark is saying, it was, it's been very challenging creating this film uh, and then trying to uh, reach out to veterans who are deep in that, you know, middle concentric ring uh, to try to reach them. But it's been a worthwhile journey to be able to do so, do so because um, I think ultimately it's worth it. Our problems still exist. Um, right now with this COVID, some of the most uh, at-risk populations are veterans. And so it becomes compact founded by um, a pandemic uh, and everything that's going to fall after this. And so I think uh, it's important to still engage in art. It's, it's still important to engage in photography. But most, more importantly, it's still important to reach out to the public and then have that public uh, reach out back out uh, to you to, to assist you. And so um, I thank you all of you for your participation to be able to allow us to do so. Awesome. Thank you all so much. And also, um, we do have a California Center for the Book. We have a quick survey. If they would see the uh, 
link that is provided. Um, and if they could go ahead and click on there, they'll be able to take the survey and help us out a lot. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy.